They met in homes predominantly. Uh, maybe, you know, God knew that one day this would happen, but uh, certainly the Bible writers did not imagine us wearing masks to church. Uh, you know, uh, now if you got one of those flappable maps, have you seen those where you can actually eat with them? I, I got to find where they sell those. Those are great because when I get my little Burger King burger and I got my mask on, I forget I have the mask on. <laughs> And I get home and my wife goes, what's all over the mask? I don't know, honey. You ate Burger King again, didn't you? <laughs> I can't get anything by this woman. So we live in a new day, guys. And uh, if you're wondering what this is, this is, uh, man, it was hot at 930 drive-in church today. So um, I stole one of Pat's best towels. Um, you know, we, do you all have closets in your house where the good towels are kept and the towels that you're supposed to clean the cars with are kept? You all know what I'm talking about? I can't figure out which is which. Because <laughs> in my house, they all look good to me. <laughs> so I'm hoping and praying for the safety of my marriage that this is one of the car towels, okay? Y'all pray for me that I, I picked right this morning at 3.30 when I got up and was selecting my, my little sweat rag there. Hey, if you have a Bible, turn with me to James chapter 2. We're in a series, if you haven't been with us or if you're visiting with us today, we're in a series verse by verse through the book of James. If you're watching online and just joining us from wherever, uh, this morning I shouted out to my folks in New York and Florida and West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Virginia, and uh, there may be people online today from one of those states or another state that uh, I haven't seen. I was scrolling by saying hi, hi to people as we were uh, singing the last song, but we welcome you that are watching us online. Uh, we realize that about uh, today, about half of our attendance is online. And let me give you some statistics. I went over with the staff this week. 50% of all regular churchgoers in America that were vibrant, going to church virtually every Sunday pre-COVID are no longer going to church or even watching online. 50% have dropped off. 30% of all Regular churchgoers, these are people that were going virtually every week, 30% say they're not coming back to church even after it opens and we get a vaccine and everything is a lot better. And so that gets the stats real way down, don't they? And I'm very proud of this church. Uh, I talked to a buddy of mine the other day. He's got a big mega church. I said, what are you running in attendance? They've been open now for about two months. And he said, we're running about 20%. About 20%. That seems to be the statistic I'm hearing across the country. 20 to 35 to 40% of people that are going back to church on site um, uh, pre-COVID numbers. Our, our numbers are running, uh, counting our drive-in church and our 11 o'clock service. Drive-in is our bigger service. Uh, we're running about 55 to 60%. So you guys are just doing good. I just want you to know, you're doing good. And we're proud of you for being good and doing good. Uh, drive-in is always a hoot. If you haven't tried it out, next Sunday we're gonna do just drive-in church. So let me give you a quick pre-announcement here. We will not have 11 o'clock service. We just wanna have a tailgate party. Uh, we figured out a lot of people are just tired of eating Burger King and, and uh, going through the drive through and not able to get into restaurants. And you guys don't go to bars, so I don't have to address that. But, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, we just thought, wouldn't it be great to get everybody together on site at a drive-in service like we did when we first reopened. Our first reopened service was a drive-in service. We had about 80 cars there, a couple hundred people, and that was fantastic, and then we divided into two. But we're gonna do all drive-in next Sunday, so just keep that in mind. Then afterwards, we're gonna have, we got some guys are in a safe way, a sanitized way. They're gonna cook uh, uh, meat for us, real meat, Real meat, not tofu, real hamburgers, hot dogs, whatever else they uh, throw on the grill there. And then we're just going to have some indoor games for kids and teens and families to come together. It'll all be done in a you know, safe way and six-foot distance. And how they're going to figure that out, I don't know. But we're just going to have, we just feel like we ought to have some fun next Sunday, okay? I don't know about you, but I get, I get a little frustrated being inside so much and can't hug anybody. I mean, I, I am hug-deprived. I want you to know that because I'm a hugger and uh, not getting able to hug. Somebody hugged me this morning at drive-in church. I thought, if they, get, if they die this week, I'm going to feel really bad. Not that I have COVID or anything, but I mean, you know, those things run through a pastor's head when you're hugging somebody. And so I, I held my breath so I wouldn't breathe on them. I hugged them. And they just kept hugging and hugging and hugging. And uh, you know, you know, I can't hold my breath as long as I used to. I said, it's going to be me that dies if they don't let go, you know. And so, so uh, we're just so glad that uh, we can participate and be uh, church together. So next Sunday, 930, please put that on your schedule. Be here with us. Uh, bring uh, kids. Bring some friends. Bring your teens. Uh, drag them here. Uh, <laughs> they're going to have a good time together. We're going to laugh a lot. We're going to get into God's Word. I'm doing a message called uh, Your Big Fat Mouth. 
from James chapter 3, because we're going to be dealing with the mouth next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. So James chapter 2 is where we're at today. If you haven't been with us, <coughs> take the opportunity, I hope you will, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to go on side. I, I don't have COVID, I have allergies, so, so if I cough, that's what it is. I just want you to know it. I was outside with my grandkids all day yesterday. They wanted to go to the park, and I realized something else about getting older. I can last about an hour at the park. And, 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 and I start about a half hour in going, now we only got five more minutes. They don't know what five minutes, they're young. You know, they don't know what five minutes is. And of course they keep me going. I got four of them pushing swings. So, you know, I'm having to run to every swing to push them, <laughs> you know, and push me, push, and they're all very competitive. If I don't push them all at the same rate or force, they get really upset. So this is my life these days, you know. Uh, somebody said, what are you going to do when, I reti- when you retire? I said, I'm going to push grandkids in swings. And so that's what I get to do on my Saturdays. But it certainly played a, a, a devil of a time with my allergies this morning when I woke up. So James chapter 2, what we're going to look at today, guys, as we jump into the Bible, we're going to look at what is real faith? What is real faith? It's a question that James asked in verse 14. What is real faith? You see, when you put the word real in front of something, it makes it sound more important, doesn't it? Like real Coke or real leather, real faith. James is gonna talk to us today about how do you determine what is real and not real when it comes to faith. So James chapter two, we're gonna look at four things that James has to say about what faith is not, and then we're gonna land the plane on what faith really is. James chapter two, verse 14, here it is. Number one on your outline, if you wanna pull that out with us, real life, uh, real faith rather, is not just something you say. James chapter two, verse 14, here's what he says. He asks this question. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can that faith save him? Now, the word claims means like they're talking about it like they really have it. Another way of looking at this would be a person that says they profess to have faith, but they don't possess faith. Do you see the difference? I can say I have it, but but saying I have faith makes me have faith no more than putting my wheelbarrow in my garage makes it a car. Just because I say something doesn't make it so. And in this world of political craziness and, and fake news, we all know that you can't trust much of what people are saying out there. So how do you determine what is real faith? Uh, I, I don't watch NASCAR, but I know probably some of you do. Anybody NASCAR fans in here? Okay, got a few, like two. <laughs> I'm too far north, aren't I? Yeah, NASCAR, you, guys, you guys are not southern enough. I know online we've got some NASCAR fans. They can beep beep right now if they want. But, but you've seen those guys, they win, they do the victory lap, they get into the winner's circle, and they get the trophy. And a lot of times they'll say, I just want to thank the good Lord, <laughs> you know. And the guy may be sincere. He may truly be thanking the Lord. He may really be a Christian. I don't, I'm not here to judge. But just because somebody says that doesn't make him a Christian. Just because somebody is good or nice or loving or kind or goes to church or gives money or serves a, a, a benevolent cause does not make them a true follower of Jesus Christ. That's what James is saying. What good, verse 14, does it do when a man claims to have faith but there's no deeds to back it up. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew chapter seven, verse 20 through 23. Jesus says this, so then you will know them by their fruits. Now keep that word in mind. Not everyone who says to me, Jesus says, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of God who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did in your name, did we not perform many miracles? And Jesus says, verse 23, But then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, those are some harsh words. I don't like hearing those words, do you? But what Jesus is saying is, if your faith doesn't have any fruit, it's a fake. (laughs) You ought to write that down. That's That's a pretty good one right there, okay? If your faith doesn't have any fruit, it's a fake. In other words, if, if if your beliefs are not demonstrated by your behavior, it's probably bad faith. That's what changes, I mean, and this goes at the very core of how a lot of us were raised. If you're Baptist or evangelical in any way, you know you were taught from the very beginning when you were in that little nursery and they were teaching you verses and you had the little flannel graphs, you know, putting those little cut out people. It's coming back incidentally. I've seen flannel graphs in church recently. If you don't know what that is, you're too young. But I'm, I'm just telling you, and, and so we were taught that it's by faith you come to Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, the apostle Paul did it great. He said, it is by grace you are saved through what? Faith. 
faith. But then he says, in verse 9 and 10, he goes on to say, but you were saved by faith to do good works. Yeah, exactly. You can talk in church, Daphne. That's okay. You get the star today. I'm going to put your name up on the refrigerator, okay? And, uh, but you, you get the idea, right? I mean, what, what, is, what, is, what, what is Paul saying? He's saying, you come to Christ by faith, accepting who Jesus is. But you demonstrate that you're truly a follower of Christ by what you do after you come to Christ. It's, it's kind of like this. When I married Pat 41 years ago, I know I don't look that old, but I am. When I married her 41 years ago, she, and, but I dated her four years before that, okay? Because it took me that long uh, to convince her <laughs> that I was worthy to be married to her. And because uh, she was a lot better person than me and still is. But... But when I first started dating her, I'd, I'd only really been walking with the Lord for two weeks. Some of you have heard this story. And, and so I was raw and I was greedy and she was beautiful and holy and spiritual and she had it all together and, and I was a mess, man. I was like messed up. I was a mess. And, and so she, because I hung around her and I wanted to be with her, she changed my life. Are, are you understand this? No more bar hopping. We were in a dry county, so it didn't matter anyway, you know. Uh, no, no more drug use. No, I mean, none of that stuff. No, no more messing around. No more partying. Now, it, it wasn't because she was being legalistic about it. It's just that in her behavior, her lifestyle, she was walking with Jesus and knew that didn't represent who Jesus is or was, okay? And, and so she, she said, if you want to date me, you're going to change. And I don't know about you, but the only one that likes change is a wet baby. And, and I remember thinking, do I really want this girl? Because there's plenty of other girls. And I mean, I'm thinking this. But then it came back, I really want her. <laughs> and when I got into relationship with her, she changed my life in a good way. Are, are y'all catching this? Like, you can't be married and act single. That gets you into trouble. <laughs> Being married changes your behavior. Wouldn't you agree? Okay, so what, what have you got? What, what is James trying to say to us? He's saying, if you're truly a follower of Jesus Christ, your behavior will demonstrate it. It will be proven by what you do. You don't get saved by being good. You don't get saved by doing works. You don't get saved by, by, by following Christ. But once you are saved, you will be better. You will be good. You will, your behavior will be transformed. The way you think will be altered. Everything, you don't change all at once. Y'all know this, right? It took me a long time to go from raw to gritty to a little bit righteous. But you are changing. The evidence of spirituality is not what you say. It's demonstrated by the fruit of your life. Okay, y'all with me so far? Okay, that's number one. So real faith is not something that you say. Here's the second one. Real faith isn't something that you feel. A lot of people will come here and they'll say, man, Antonio, when he leads all those, those songs, I don't know about you, but that second song really got to me. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I was just watching our feed as I was responding to people and people were responding, you know, great, wow, 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 wow. And, and man, I, I, I feel good when I leave here, don't you? I feel better because I came to church. You feel better because you're watching online from your couch. But, but I want to tell you something. I can get a quiver in my liver and go out there and five minutes later, I can be, I can be raw and gritty again. <laughs> I, I, I may not, I'm, on Monday, I may not act like I'm, I'm truly a follower of Jesus. I mean, you see, it's not just something I, I feel. And, and while I can feel spiritual things, and I can feel God's spirit pumping on my heart, and I can feel the Holy Ghost, you know, giving me some spiritual goosebumps, that doesn't mean I'm a Christian. <laughs> There's a lot of good people out there that go to churches and go to Christian concerts, and they feel something, but their life isn't transformed. You say, well, how do you know? Look at James chapter two again, verses 15 and 16. James gives us this example. He says, suppose a brother or sister, in fact, in James chapter two, because he uses this also in, in the early part of the chapter, is the only time women, I'm gonna give you a fun fact, the only time you're called sisters in the Bible is right here. I know you're just astounded at my spiritual wisdom, but <laughs> I just want to give you a fun fact. So he says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm, keep well fed, but does nothing about his spiritual needs or his physical needs. What good is that? It'd be like me in the car, and I'm getting in, and I get in first because I'm usually a little faster than Pat, and, and Pat gets in, but she doesn't quite get in, and the door slams, and her hand is caught in the door. 
And I start the car and I start driving slowly down the highway and I say, hey, Pat, hey, sorry you didn't get all the way in. Um, you know, just hang on. We'll be at the house in a couple of miles. I, I, I know how you feel. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But my spiritual life is demonstrated that I really know Jesus Christ in the way I treat other people. You've heard, me te- you've heard me teach this, haven't you? That the true indicator that you love God is you love other people. That's it. Jesus said it this way. Two commandments you gotta keep. Old Testament, you gotta keep 10. I don't know about you, but I struggled with some of those 10 in my early days. But two is all Jesus gave. Love God, love people. You get that right, you're probably on the right track. That's what Jesus said. So it begins with a loving God, coming into a personal relationship with God. But how do you know you've truly come into a personal relationship with God? James just told us, you will meet the needs of the people that God brings into your path. Now let me tell you something, I can't meet everybody's needs. Y'all know that, right? You can't meet everybody's needs. One of our staff this week uh, texted me and said they were at Wawa and then there was somebody there with a sign, you know, one of those signs, you know, hungry, you know, please give or whatever they say. And um, she decided she would minister to this person. And so she escorted this person into, uh, into the Wawa, bought them lunch, gave them a card, inviting them to church, shared her faith a little bit, prayed for them, whatever she did. And she is an example of what James is talking about. If you see somebody in need that God places across your path, that, that you know they're in need. And if you avoid it, I mean, I don't know about you, but every time I pull up in the, I don't know if you got them in Delaware, but we got them in West Virginia, people that stand at the I-81 uh, exits, and I always get a red light. I don't know about you, but I am, I am cursed. I always get a red light, and there's a person standing there, you know, homeless, veteran, you know, whatever it says on the sign. Now, in our area, they pay. There's a guy that pays people to stand there, and he, he's become a very wealthy person by getting people to stand there and get a bunch of money. So you got to use some discernment here. But my heart goes out to people that are in need. Why? Because Jesus solved my need, my spiritual need for him. And when he solved my spiritual need for a relationship with God, I became acutely more aware of the needs around me. So one of the ways that you know, James is saying, that you're truly a follower of Jesus Christ is you're going to meet the needs of the people that God brings into your path or that he prompts you to meet. First John 3.17 puts it this way. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? I mean, John just cuts it to the chase. If you say you have the love of God, you feel you've got the love of God, but you don't engage the needs that are around you, you don't have the love of God. And this is cutting to the quick, isn't it? Some of you are going, man, I should have watched Joel Osteen today or something, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just being honest. This is, the, this is what the Bible says. So, so one, of the things that we, one of the things about real faith is this. Real faith is not something we say. Real faith is not something that we feel. Here's the third thing. Real faith is not just something that you think. James chapter two, verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. In other words, what James is saying is this. You may, be, you may be an intellectual person. You may try to figure Jesus out. You may know the Bible from cover to cover. You may know uh, uh, the arguments of the great doctrines of the faith. You, you may be an intellectual giant when it comes to spiritual things. But guys, just thinking about things spiritual, just analyzing them, debating them, doesn't make you a follower of Jesus Christ. Any more than me engaging which just brings, Islam makes me a follower of Muhammad or, or Allah. Just studying about something, just knowing all the facts, just getting it around your head doesn't change your life. James is saying, if you say that you have faith, then I have the right to say, show it. <laughs> just don't know it, show it. And you've met people like that, haven't you? That are intellectual, spiritual, like, I mean, they are in the stratosphere they know stuff. But how many of you know you can know stuff and not know the right person? Okay? I can read about Abraham Lincoln, but I don't know Abraham Lincoln. I can be impressed by his life. I can honor him as a great president, but I don't know him. Because knowing entails relationship. So, real faith is not something I say, 
It's not something that I feel. It's not something I think. Let me give you one more. Real faith is not something you believe. James chapter two, verse 19. He has again asked this question. You believe that there is one God? Good. Could you try again? Why are you talking to me? Hmm. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> okay, don't tell me you don't talk to your phone. <laughs> right? The other day I was in the, I, I'm not going to tell you that story. Anyway, uh, <laughs> she always gets me right about the time that she shouldn't. So real faith is not something that you believe. You believe there's one God, good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. What is James saying? He's saying, listen, if you say, I don't believe in God, let me tell you something. The devil does. <laughs> you don't believe in Jesus? Demons believe in Jesus. In fact, in the Bible, when demons came up against Jesus, the Bible says they were terrified because they knew who Jesus was. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus, but they knew about Jesus. Are, are you getting this? So you can say, you know, I, I believe all you want to. Well, the devil believes and the demons believe, but belief does not make you a follower of Jesus Christ. Again, going back to the beginning, you can be a professor of Christianity, but not a possessor of Christianity. To possess it means to come into relationship. So let me pull all this together in these last few moments. How do we then walk the walk the way that James is describing for us? Jesus put it this way, Matthew chapter seven, verse 13 and 14. Jesus said, describing the Christian life, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter it. But the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who who find it? What was Jesus saying? Jesus saying when it comes to the spiritual life of faith, it's narrow. Marriage is narrow. Wouldn't you agree? You make a covenant with your wife or husband that they are the only one. If you said those great words, I'm doing a wedding right after the service today. And one of the phrases that we will use, you know, for better or worse, you know, through thick or thin, rain or storm, you know, in-laws, you know, whatever you throw in there, you know, I'm going to stay committed to you. For the rest of my life. That's a commitment we make at marriage. What does that mean? It means I am exclusively yours. I'm not going to look for anybody else. I'm not going to date anybody else. I am going to be yours. That's what marriage is. Now, some of you would say, well, that's narrow. That's what makes it marriage. <laughs> marriage is by nature narrow. If you try to act single while you're married, you won't be married very long. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Jesus said the Christian life is also narrow. It's about exclusively about him. It's about a relationship with him. It's about coming into an intimacy with him. And in that walk of faith, I want to just close with these last few things. Jesus describes it as a narrow way versus a wide way that many people go on to. How do we understand that? Let me talk to you about, very quickly, the walkway of faith. The walkway of faith. Faith, let me give you this definition. Faith is a reliance on what God has said or is saying. That's a very simple definition. It's not what you believe, it's not what you feel, it's not what you say, it's not what you think. What is faith? Faith is reliance on what God says. When you rely on what God says, it will change your life, how you think, how you act, how you react. It'll change the way you relate to people. It'll change your relationships with people because that's what Jesus does. You can't get married to Jesus and live the same way, amen? You can't get married to a spouse and act like you're single. I'm just trying to bring this back around so you get this this morning. So the walkway of faith is narrow and faith is a reliance on what God has said that changes my total life. Now on either side of the walkway, there are some ditches. And one of those ditches are emotions. How many of you get up in the morning or maybe at the end of the day if you've been beat to death at work and, and you don't even feel like you're a Christian? <laughs> like you lost it all. You know, or you lose your temper and you say some things that you shouldn't go, oh my, I must have lost. See, your emotions are not good indicators of your faith. They are highly unreliable. See, emotionally, when somebody drives me off the side of the road, I want to just emotionally repay the favor. Don't you? You say, well, that's not very spiritual. Come on, don't tell me you guys are that. You all thought that too, haven't you? But my spiritual side says I am different now. So I just say, God bless you. <laughs> Sometimes. Not all the time. When I don't, I have to repent. 
But see, if the devil gets me, it's because I get into the ditch of emotions. When I start living on the basis of my emotions, the devil beats the spiritual snot out of me. So stay on the narrow way, which is relying upon what God has said. What did God say about the guy that drove you off the side of the road? He says, bless those that persecute you. <laughs> right? So if I'm going to choose the way of Jesus, I bless them rather than curse them. But if I get in the ditch because my emotions are involved, I'll start acting like the devil rather than Jesus Christ. So the ditch of emotions. On the other side of that walkway of faith is the ditch of intellect. And the ditch of intellect says this, I can figure it out without God. And how many of you know we get into trouble when we try to figure things out without God? Amen? Wouldn't you agree? When we think we know better, we can figure it out. How many times have you gotten involved in a relationship, if you're, uh, if you're uh, single or if you're married, going back maybe some years, and you got in a relationship thinking, I've got it all figured out. They are the one. <laughs> and you realized about six months later, oh, my gosh. What have I done? See, the Bible gives you some guidelines of how to date. Gives you some guidelines of how to choose the right partner. Faith is reliance upon what God says. If I get into the ditch of emotions or intellect, the devil has a right to beat the spiritual snot of me. So that's the walkway of faith. Look at the second one, the word of faith. The word of faith. Romans 10, 17 says that faith is always based on and abides in what God has says. And I get more faith by hearing the word of Christ. What is the word of Christ? It's right here in this Bible. That's why on Wednesday nights we're studying the Bible, book by book. We're looking at the, the makeup of the Bible. We're trying to get our lives aligned with this Bible. Why? Because this is the success manual for successful spiritual living. So the word of faith is all found in here. If I want better faith, I get into this book. Well, what are the ditches? Well, one of the ditches is presumption. Presumption. This, this is a thing like, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, 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 I presume that I know what God is saying. I could go to Taco Bell and eat three burritos and have the same experience. <laughs> about two o'clock in the morning. My body is talking. Presumption says, I think I know what I ought to do. I don't connect with Christ. I don't understand Christ. I don't know the word, which leads us to the other ditch, which is the ditch of ignorance. When I just avoid what God has said. When I, when I know I should get in here and figure it out based on God's word, but, but I don't because, because, again, pride, I think I can figure it out by myself. So those are the two ditches of the word of faith. And then thirdly, there is the work of faith, the work of faith. And you say, well, what is this? Well, it's what James 2.14 was referring to a moment ago. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Think of Noah. God comes to Noah one day, hey, going to be a great flood. Boom, boom, boom. It's going to rain, 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 rain. Get ready, uh, uh, Noah. Uh, but I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to take care of you. Your family's going to be safe. And Noah could have said, thank you, God, that you're going to rescue me. But then God said, there's a work of faith. Now, Noah believed God, that God was going to send a flood, that God was going to protect him. But then his faith had to work. For 120 years, he had to build a boat in a desert that had never seen rain. How many times has God said something to you in a word that also had to be matched by a walk? You say, well, what are the two ditches of the, of the walk of faith? Well, one is hyperactivity. Thinking I've got to do all these things to please God when all that God is pleased with is my obedience. Just hear and obey. Hyperactivity. The other one is, and I'll use the couch for this because this is a really, really, I'm probably going to lose my Facebook people here, but this is really a nice couch. I mean, John, I could, I could take a nap on this couch. In fact, if you come down on, on Monday at 5 o'clock, I may be on this couch taking a nap before I draw. I don't know. Might be. But passivity is the other ditch. Passivity says, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> I'll just let God do it all. Well, if Noah would have had that attitude, he would have been wiped away by the flood, right? Noah got up every day and worked on that stinking boat for 120 years at the ridicule and laughter of all those people around him. So passivity, moving past that ditch means I stay on the narrow way as I hear what God wants done and I walk it out with my life, which leads us to the last one, the weight of faith, the weight of faith. How many of you know there's always a time lag between God's promises and God's provision. What do I do while I wait? I've, I've talked to you this before. You praise your way through your problems. Just get out the book of Psalms. 
Read some of those to God. Read them out loud so the devil can hear you. Read out loud so that you can hear it. Read out loud for your family. We're gonna, you're having a family problem. Get out the Bible, read some Psalms out loud and praise your way through the problem. While you wait for God to work, you praise. That's how you get through it. I mean, while some counseling is necessary, I wanna tell you this, 90% of all counseling is unnecessary because what happens is we get into a negative thing and we quit hearing God and we're not following God and we're not praising God and so our, our, our mind and our will and emotions get all mixed up and while there is valid counseling, I wanna say this to you, I'm gonna save you $150 a half hour bill, okay? I'm gonna bankrupt some counselors in here. <laughs> For most of you, you don't need counseling, you need praise. Get your praise on. Do what you did when the first song came out today. You were clapping and you were raising your hands and your heart was beating fast and your mind wasn't on your problem, your mind was on the Lord. That's what praise music does. So crank up the music, man. Turn it up. Get us some 70s decibels out there. Get the who singing praise songs if you can. But just get it going on, folks, because when you do, your emotions and your mind and your will and your spirit change when you praise rather than pout. You say, what are the ditches on this one? Hopelessness, manipulation. Hopelessness just says, I've waited a long time and nothing's happened. Uh, this uh, Tuesday night, I'm going to meet a guy that my youngest daughter just started dating. And I just found out about this. Um, dads are always the last to know. She's 27. And uh, so she wants to have me to dinner and Pat and I meet, meet this guy. And I don't know about you dads, but I don't care if they're 17 or 27. You don't deserve my daughter. <laughs> it's just the if you're not if you're not a dad, you don't understand. But if you're a dad, you know what I'm talking about. Nobody can match up. It's just the way it is. <laughs> and so, so, uh, so I was talking to her the other day before she met this guy. It was a couple of months ago, and she said, "Dad, here I am. I'm in my mid late twenties, and you know I'm not married and." You know, and, and she's a beautiful girl, absolutely gorgeous. I mean, beautiful. And um, I, I don't think I'm ever going to get married. See, she was moving into the ditch. She was moving in the ditch. Now, God had given her a promise many years ago that she was going to be married one day. God had given her a promise that she's going to have children. I mean, God gave her all these promises. So, but how many of you know when God takes his time, like heaven time, you can get hopeless, right? It's the ditch of hopelessness. And the only way to get out of it is to praise your way through it. And then the other one is manipulation. We can do like Abraham did when God told him, Abraham, you're going to have a kid. And he's going to be the father of, of the Jews, and, and they're going to be my chosen people. And, and so he turns 70, and he turns 75, and then 80, and 85, he's getting towards 90, and still no stinking kid. So his wife comes up with a plan. He agrees to it. Get with the concubine, her servant, and have a baby, and we'll take care of this whole promise thing. He has a baby, name him Ishmael. Ishmael, the descendants of Ishmael are the Arabs, and today in the Middle East, they've been fighting since the days of Abraham simply because Abraham didn't wait on God. Y'all understand that? You say, why, why, people ask me all the time, why, why do we have so conf much conflict in the Middle East? This didn't start in 1948. This didn't start in 1880. This didn't start because they carved out the Middle East after World War II. This started in Abraham's day. You see, man, that's a huge example. Folks, it's the same thing for us when we try to manipulate our way to achieve God's promises and we don't wait on God to do it his way. That's a ditch to watch out for. So what do we mean by all this? Let me give you the last two things on your outline, what real faith is. Real faith is something done for you and responded to by you, something done for you and responded to by you. Let's look at these last few verses of the second chapter, James chapter two, verse 20. James is again asking a question, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? I mean, we pretty well got that settled now, don't we? Was not Abraham, our father, justified? And the word, there's two words in the New Testament for justified. One is to be acquitted, to be made right, that's what happens when we accept Jesus in our life. The other word justified is the word that is used here, and it means to demonstrate. In other words, you've got it, now you're demonstrating it by what you do. So that's the word justified that is used here. So Abraham, our father, was justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. Some of you know that story from Genesis. 
You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected or made mature. And the scripture was fulfilled, verse 23, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Incidentally, the Bible says that Abraham believed God before the whole offering of Isaac on the altar. Are, are you getting this? So he had faith before the works. That's how it works in the Christian life. Verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works, again, using the word demonstrated, but not by faith alone. You say, well, Ron, what does all that mean? It simply means this, that real faith is demonstrated by what I do. I don't get salvation because of what I do, but once I get salvation, I do what God requires because of my love for him. Let me give you this illustration. Um, I, I have a notorious, some of you men may do this too. I have a notorious thing about leaving dishes in the sink. Anybody, anybody else besides me? Guilt? Come on, got men. Come on, help me here. Anybody leave dishes? Okay, okay. A woman raises her hand. Okay, yeah. Okay. Now we got some honesty going on in church. Remember, you're in church. You can't lie in church. And so I'll look at them and go, I know I need to put them in the dish. We even have a dishwasher now. We didn't have a dishwasher in the early days of our marriage. We have a dishwasher now. But to move the dishes from the sink to the dishwasher is work. But I'm the first one up. I usually get about 3.30, quarter to four, and uh, I see the dishes that I left the night before. My ice cream bowl, my coffee cup, you know, my Cocoa Krispies, my Debbie Cape wrapper. You know, you get the idea. Yeah, I'm, I really eat healthy. And, and, and I'll mentally go, it would bless my wife if I put those dishes in the sink. But then I go, I've got a three-hour drive to church. She's home all day. She can put them in the dishwasher. Angel, devil on the shoulder. Y'all get the idea, right? Okay. So the other morning, there were a lot of dishes because my daughter just moved back in with us with her kids. And it's different. And... Um, <laughs> We don't have a very big house, so it's different. I love my kids, love my daughter, but it's different. <laughs> and uh, so there was more dishes in there. And I go, let them put them away. But then the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Do you love your wife? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew what he was going to do. <laughs> then stay and do the dishes. But Lord, stay and do the dishes. I didn't do it just because I was prompted by the Holy Spirit. I did it because I love my wife. Are you getting this? Amen. You don't obey God to get his approval or to get into relationship with God. You're already in relationship with God if you know Jesus. But you do what he says because you do love him. You see the difference? Amen. You don't do it to get loved. You do it because you are loved and you do love. And I wonder right now, would you just stand with me? And I want you just to close your eyes if you're here in the building with us. If you're online, just close your eyes with me for just a moment. I want to wrap up this way. Just with your heart before God. I, I, I just got a sneaky suspicion that there are some people online, there's some people maybe even in here that learn something new about faith today. Faith isn't something you say, it's not something you feel, it's not something you think, it's not something you believe. Faith is someone you accept. And you may think you're a Christian. You may be a member of a church somewhere. You may have been baptized as a Catholic. You may have been, you know, sanctioned as an Episcopalian, poured on by a Presbyterian. It doesn't matter. You can know about somebody but not really know them. And what Jesus Christ is calling you to do right now, this simple time together, is to invite him into your life. Then true change begins. He calls it becoming a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. And maybe today you just became consciously aware that you really don't have Jesus. Because your life really hasn't changed. And my invitation to you today is to get Jesus. 
The same way in just a few moments when I do this wedding, they're going to say, I do to one another. You have to say, I do. I do accept you, Jesus, into your life. You say, Ron, you don't know what I'm doing. You don't know who I am. And I I talked with somebody today. They said, I've got a long rap sheet. (laughs) Jesus has seen worse. (laughs) What Jesus is looking for is a relationship with you. Just with your eyes closed, your heart before God, whether you're online or in the building. If you really would like to have Jesus in your life, real faith, maybe this could be your prayer today. Lord Jesus, I really do need you. I do need change in my life. I need my sins forgiven, and I need you to become the leader of my life. So right now, I ask you to come in. And make the change that I need in my life to happen. And just with your eyes still closed, if that's something that that you just asked Jesus to come in, or you'd like to be prayed for and learn more about that, I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask some of the deacons and wives to come to the front. And man, if you... If you ask Jesus to come in your life and you're in the building with us, or if you'd like to become part of this family, you just recently maybe asked Jesus to come in, or you've been visiting us for a while and you want to become part of this body of believers, I'm going to ask you to come and take John or Michelle, one of our others, deacons and wives, by the hand and just say whatever that decision is that you're making today. To receive Christ, become part of this church, just be prayed for. Man, they are right here at the front. They would love to pray and talk with you. If you're online with us, You can go to our FBCDE app or FBCDE.com. Click on connect. There's a connection card. It says right on there, I would like to receive Christ. Man, submit that. I want to get back with you this week and talk with you about your new life and your new journey with Jesus. Last week, we baptized a ton of people. We got a ton of people to baptize in a couple weeks. People have been getting saved. They've been coming to Christ during COVID. It's crazy. Crazy. But it's God. So right now, in this quiet moment, we're going to take just a moment. If you need to come, right now, you come. So we'll be seated for just a moment. And uh, if you're online, just hang with us for another couple moments. We've got a video we want to show, just like a 30, 60 second video that you're going to enjoy. Hey, we're going to take our offering as we, uh, we're trying to be social distancing and uh, sanitizing everything and all those things that we have to do to be COVID compliant. Uh, it's just a lot more work, but we're doing it because we want to make sure you're safe and that you're protected as best that we can do so. So as you go out today, instead of passing the plates, if you'd like to give your offering or if you'd like to turn in the connection card that's attached to your bulletin, please, there's plates right back here. If you have any questions, some of our men and women will be back there to help you out as well. If you're online with us or flashing right now how to give electronically, uh, just hit the button, it goes, and all the magic happens. Uh, I don't understand how it happens, but it does happen. I just see money debited out of my account when it happens. And so, and I know that I'm blessing the Lord because I'm participating in supporting his ministry here at First Baptist. So if you go to another church somewhere online, give to that church, okay? They will be blessed because of your giving. Hey, two quick announcements. Next week, as I mentioned, not in here, everything at 930. 
great time tailgating together at 9.30 service drive-in next week. Uh, don't forget tonight is the living room at 6.30. Hey, check out uh, uh, Pastor Mike and uh, Leroy as they share in the book of Acts. And then this Wednesday night at 7 is our first Wednesday of the month. All worship night. Many of you participate in that with us. It's a little different than being all together, but knowing that we've got just many, many people worshiping God in their living rooms, at their offices, in their cars as they drive. Uh, this Wednesday night, seven, all worship night. So Antonio's going to have a great time uh, leading us into worship on Wednesday night at seven. Hey guys, uh, we got uh, need another second there, Brandy. No, go ahead and come up here. I already know who you are anyway. Okay, and give me that sheet just for a second because. I want to make sure I get that all correct. Good. Um, this, this young lady, uh, we got to baptize her last Sunday. She had accepted Jesus into her life. And she's coming forward today to unite with us in membership to be part of our family. So welcome her to our First Baptist family today. We're so excited about that. We're excited about you. I'm losing my earpiece here. But uh, it's uh, good because it's time to be done anyway. We are so glad to have you and your children. And how many grandkids does that mama have over there? Oh, you have a fifth generation. But isn't it been exciting to see so many in your family coming to Christ, being baptized? Isn't that cool? I just thought, yeah, that's exciting. That's exciting. Hey, have a seat. I'll let, the, I'll let you get finished up on uh, filling out the paperwork there. And, uh, hey, guys, we're going to show just a closing thing. If you give us 60 more seconds, we got that video ready. This is our Move the Mountain video. Many of you have been asking, how are we doing on Moving the Mountain, which is our debt relief that we're trying to do. And uh, so let's show that right now, and that will be the close to our service. <laughs> 